Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Uh, pretty good. When did you start BYO? Um, 1979. The concept was uh, we were, I felt that punk rock was getting a bad rap because the media kept talking about all the riots and the with the police and the fighting and the slamming and the mm -hmm. and I thought you know we need to start something that really p puts forth the positive aspects of the music the ideas so it was a concept that I had um, but it was just a concept so I have my little brother Adam my little they're all my little brothers but Adam was did illustration and he made this drawing um, you know of like a punk and a skinhead and a uh, mod looking guy on the cover, you know, sort of united. Because there was also increasing, as punk rock was increasing in size in the LA, especially the young, my brothers and I got involved in it. Mark and I, a year younger than me, we got involved in it in 78. And at that time, it was really this sort of arty scene. And that 100 Punk song by Generation X really kind of described the LA punk scene in those days and we thought well most of the people were older they were all mid to late 20s and even up into their 50s um, very arty scene which was cool we were the kid we were the handful of teenagers with a few other people but we thought it would be great when all the surfers and skaters see what this is about because then it's gonna explode and that's what was happening it was exploding but as it exploded there was always this sort of oh, you're from here and you're from here and somehow, you know, we're going to fight each other. I mean, we had enough enemies walking down the street that we didn't need to be fighting each other. So that was really sort of the basis of BYO is that we need to unite all these differing people coming from different areas to put forth the positive aspects that we're speaking about in the music. We can't get bogged down into stupid territorial bullshit. So you were saying 1978, England was like a real, like a lot of the bands started in England and now we're in California. How did that, like the sound, like how did you come up with like the, you know, how did, was the LA bands coming up with their sound? Were they really influenced by that? Or I mean, like you were saying like the skaters and the surfers were getting into it was, how was that yeah, kind I mean, of turning into what I can only was? speak for myself and for me, the first thing I heard that was remotely punk rock was, Elvis Costello, they played the whole My Aim is True. I read about the Sex Pistols in 77. Robert Hilburn, the big LA music critic, wrote in the Times. So those two things were, wow, this is, this is, I dig this shit. I started listening to music and I'm all, I'm not playing covers of Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix anymore. I'm gonna write my own shit. Um, and then I know that when it started spreading and I started meeting people from Huntington Beach and South Bay and all over up in Oxnard and you know. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask like with BYO when you guys started it was how important was it to focus more on people around you or was it like the idea was like, oh, we're gonna get a band like, you know, you know, the Buzzcocks or the Sex Pistols I, I, or something like, not them, but like, Yeah, you know. for, for us, it was just whatever we liked, that's what we wanted to uh -huh. see, you know, it was not, we never thought of it as, oh, this band's from England or this band's from New York or this band. It was just, it's punk rock music. It inspires us to want to go out and make change in the world, to play music and promoting shows. All the things we did, starting a record label, everything was, came out of necessity. Yeah. That's why it was DIY, because we couldn't go and play the Roxy and the Whiskey anymore. They, they did shows for a while and then there would be a fight or a riot or whatever. So we had to promote our own shows and find a hall. So it was always DIY. And English bands, we like the English bands. We get in contact with some, they wanna come over here and play. Hell yeah, let's put on a show. We, we're fans of the band. You know, one, one thing was really interesting here in LA, we never had, we didn't know anything about this idea when English bands would come over and they would try to make the opening band set up in front of the drum kit and not use the full PA and all that shit. And we, we said, no, no, you get up there and you kick ass. If the band opening for you blows you away, that's on you. You don't get to try and sabotage their performance by not giving them the same things that you have. It, it's a weird th thing in England where they, the, the press would build bands up only to knock them down when they got big. Yeah, I got, it's yeah. terrible. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. but 
punk rock, right? <laughs> well, the thing is here, it's always been, a, it's been this sort of family community thing where we all try to support each other, you know, and help each other out. At least from where I come from, that, that was always a thing. I, I, my, my mission has always been, I, if I like your band and I like what you're saying, I want to see you succeed. Yeah. Right? Because I want people to hear your music, which is why we did all the things that we did, why we started a label, because, hey, we need to put a record out, and now we meet Seven Seconds and SNFU. Let's put their records out. They're awesome bands. We met those bands because we went on the road. When we would travel, it was the local bands that put the shows on, you know, the record store, the band, the college radio station, the fanzine in that town. So there was a community, hopefully, in every town that was helping push punk rock and the ideas and the community. And that's something that amazingly still exists to a certain extent. Now, well, we're talking 40 years, 40 plus years later. Yeah, so BYO started, was it, was it the first idea to like put out records or was it to like just all at the same time? Like it, it was started in those days to be um, just, hey, we need to have a positive voice about what punk rock really is so that the press doesn't just go, come in and see what they want to see and write about the, you know, the spectacular, oh, violence, the way they dance, the way they dress, the way they look. If you look back, there were shows in the late 70s and early 80s. I mean, there were punk rockers on the Phil Donahue, and there was a whole bunch of little local talk shows. Yeah. Uh, you know, and they would always just do the most ridiculous, exploitative things about all the horrible things, the negative things. So. For me, BYO, the idea was let's promote all the positive things that we're doing. The rest of it came naturally. You know, well, we want to do a show. All the clubs don't want to do shows with punk bands. We have to do it together, you know, and that's, that's what we did. We put on our own shows. Eventually, we start putting out records because we, we organized tours. We did another State of Mind tour, and a couple of guys came along and filmed it, made it into a documentary. So that's so how all these things happen. how long was it until, like when youth brigade started was that that was like around 1980 yeah we started off so i um was going to santa monica city college uh and i i took a singing class which was kind of interesting and every week you had to sing a song and everybody was doing local you know what's popular but me, I, I liked old swing music, right? Okay. And the teacher loved that I was doing that. And so I would just go to the library and try and find recordings with vocals that, that I liked, right? So Tex Beneke had a song called The Little Man Who Wasn't There, which is basically about him coming home late at night drunk and seeing a man on the stairs, which of course he was just drunk. And so I sang that and I'd find other stuff. I started a band with my brother saying let's do this band we, we'd already had bands in high school that were cover bands and stuff but i said let's do this band we'll call it the swing skins brigade and we you know in those days horn players were in the high school band right so we started recruiting out of the recycler which was you know a, a, a wanted ad it, it was basically the the paper in those days for if you wanted to sell stuff uh, like Craigslist became, but that was online. So, so we had advertised, we had these guys come in. Um, it was pretty, f within the first day we realized we were not good enough musicians to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so then it morphed into, well, we can play punk rock. So, and that's how it became Youth Brigade. Yeah, but I also think like you're, the style and maybe it's like the, I mean, for me, like, you know, I grew up on hardcore and it was like always screaming and yelling. And like then once I started hearing bands like Youth Brigade and Seven Seconds that were actually singing, you know, it's like, oh, you know, and it, it brought that like, there actually is some music. And, yeah. and it kind of proved that like, you know, like it's not just, oh, we just have to play fast and it doesn't matter, we know how to play. And like, so it, it's, it's interesting to hear like how that started and if that was like a conscious thing to be like more melodic. I, I think it was the influence of all the bands. So the, uh, the whole concept of hardcore didn't exist yet, right? The early punk rock stuff was very melodic. You listen to the Buzzcocks. True, yeah. You know, and you listen to the Bags out here and the bands that were playing. And then as the scene here developed and started to explode, you really have the, that Orange County sound that really started with Adolescence, um, TSOL, Social Distortion, you know. and. It's just all melodic. We we were I was heavily influenced by skinhead bands like Angelic Upstarts, Cockney Rejects, Sham 69, who I love too. But melody, to me, I'm a singer. 
the lead instrument in a band is always going to be the vocal. Yeah. And, if you, and if you're just screaming, I mean, okay, that has value, I guess. People dig it. There's a power in that. But for me, you have to be able to sing. What I enjoy is melody. Melody, you, you also can't just sing what the guitar is playing. If the guitar is going, na 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 and the singer is going, na 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 it's really, it's kind of boring. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, sure, when you start a band and you've never been in a band before and you just start playing, those are the things you're going to do because it's just easy, right? But the trick is to be able to have a melody, have that vocal be the lead, have a melody that counterpoints whatever the music is, the music should be background. Um, and, you know, we're influenced also by the 70s music that we grew up on. The late 60s, Motown, Soul, all that stuff was really important when we were growing up and that morphed. The, I mean, let's go back, blues, you know, is the basis of rock and roll. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, because I'm thinking like, man, starting a punk rock band in 1980, there aren't any punk rock influences. So like, you well, know, so, you there, know, there, there are, but you know, it's like, not like oh, I want to start a band now. Like, I want to sound like you know, yeah. you know. There's hundreds and hundreds million of bands. bands. I can now, make yeah. up band names that are, that are right. You know, like, um, so it's just thinking and then hearing about like oh swing music and then it makes total sense then to hear the melody behind the like the music. So, yeah, you know, so. I mean we come from a musical family. My my parents had us go take piano lessons when we were you know eight nine years old. I played in the high school band. I played sax for a while. I liked Jethro Tull, so I tried to play the flute for a minute. <laughs> Um, you know, my brother liked a girl in the orchestra, so he played violin for a second. Yeah. There's always reasons that you start the stuff. Sometimes it's sick, sometimes it doesn't. But my father played guitar and, and, and sang folk songs when he was going to medical school in Toronto. Um, my grandfather played the piano. So, you know, those things are always going to influence you. And then it's the music you grew up listening to. And, you know, we grew up listening to 70s rock and roll and then yeah. then punk rock happened and we said wow and the english bands were at the times doing some of the best music for me you know the stranglers are a huge influence on me too i love them the class huge influence on me as well the jam i love them love all those bands still love them today still listen to all that we, we were lucky enough to have the stranglers play at, at our festival a few years ago amazing guys amazing band just such a pleasure to deal to see you know sometimes you're the bands that you really love don't can let you down but most of the punk bands, they're still true to what, what started them off. So going back to starting BYO, starting Youth Brigade, you know, punk rock starting, you being a teenager. Yeah. How, like, where did this come from? Because obviously there was like not like your friend or you heard about a guy that also did it. Or like there's another. You know, yeah. You know, so it's like there's like there's got to be some original thought here, which I'm really interested in seeing how that creative process. I mean, when we were kids, I grew up in Toronto, moved out to California when I was 10. I mean, if we wanted stuff, we had to work, you know, we, we did chores, but that wasn't enough. The allowance we got. So. We would, you know, in the fall rake leaves, in the winter we'd shovel snow, the neighbors, and then in the, in the spring and the summer we'd sell lemonade, whatever. We were always trying to figure ways to make more money because, you know, we couldn't work jobs yet. Yeah. Um, we moved to California, we were out in Hidden Hills for the first few years. They bust us to this middle school and they had a student store where they sold candy, but their candy sucked. So. My brother and I, we'd buy a bunch of candy and we'd bring it to school and we would sell it. And the principal found out and he said, you can't sell candy. And we said, why? And he's all, because you're taking business away from the school and you're not allowed to sell candy. And we said, but your candy sucks. So that's why people are buying our candy instead of your candy. And then when we got, when we moved onto the west side and we, we, you know, we started smoking weed and I realized, well, why do I want to buy a few joints I could just buy an ounce, roll it to joint, sell it to my friends and smoke for free. And, you know, it's this sort of entrepreneur thing of how can I make, you know, how can I do what I want to do for free or make a little money, make a living off of what I love to do, what I enjoy doing. Um, and that just morphed into, you know, I always tell this story. When I was a senior in high school, my first semester English class was ex existential literature. My second semester was Herman Hess. And that was, I was reading Albert Camus and Sartre and Kierkegaard and Hess and Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. That 
year of 77, 78, my senior year, while I was learning about punk rock, right? And so it all sort of coalesced. And so we got, I got into punk rock because I thought existentialism and the, the, this philosophy that I was reading about, about how people have to think for themselves and have to try and make the world a better place, um, that tied for me into what I was hearing in punk rock. And that's what inspired me to say, I gotta write my own songs, talk about the things that are important to me. Um, and it was just inevitable that the business acumen that we learned, cause I, I, all through high school, I worked different jobs. I worked in a bunch of crappy restaurants, um, cooking, uh, del doing delivery for a bunch of different pizza places, working at a health food store, stocking shelves, you know, all, all kinds of different jobs. So I realized pretty young that, you know, I'll work these shitty jobs, but what I would really love to do is create jobs, doing things that I want, be my own boss. I don't think it was a, a conscious thing. It just sort of happened um, that, hey, well, I'm playing music. Um, we got to put on shows. We, you know, we, we need to play shows. I learned pretty quickly that a lot of the promoters were shady, we'll do it ourselves, we can do it better. Um, same thing, like I said before, doing a tour. I, who am I gonna go, to an agent? They're not, they're not gonna book a tour for us, so I figured it out, you know. We, there was a, this group called the Yippies, which you may have heard of. They published, it, back in those days, AT&T was the only uh, phone company and they came up with this idea well hey when you're away from home you can have your phone calling card which was your phone number and four digits yeah. well the yippies published a poster Reagan was in office at the point and it was a caricature of, of, of Nancy and Ronnie smoking a big joint right and on that poster it said here's all the phone calling cards for the FBI the CIA the KKK the Nazi party coca-cola 18 you know everybody and also everybody who has a phone has a calling card the four digit code at the end is based on here's how you figure out what the card calling card is so that enabled every punk band to be able to make free phone calls to book tours right and that that was a big expense in those days to make those phone calls and eventually AT&T figured it out started calling people you know if you made it at somebody's house or like, who made all these phone calls yeah. then you had to start going to pay phones and uh -huh. so it was a it was an interesting time back then it's really awesome to hear because I did the same thing in, yeah. the, in the early 90s and late 80s. You know, same, like, oh, yeah, I got a calling card and yeah. be on the corner. So we passed it down. And the, the Yippies, yeah, yeah, it was the Yippies who figured all that shit out and, and, you know, basically put it out to everybody else. Right. That's incredible. So going back to, um, you know, Youth Brigade recording records, you know, I think like one of the most known is Sound and Fury, but there's two Sound yeah. and Furies. Yeah. Why, why did you do another record and call it the same? Well, so we went, we found this studio called Mystic Studio, which I referred now to as Mistake because I think it was a mistake going there. But, um, but we recorded a, 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 some tracks there for us and for aggression and for some other bands for this someone got their head kicked in which is the first release on BYO and then we came up with the idea of we should go out and do a tour so we thought okay we need to make a full album because that's what you do right you tour because you have an album so we went in we made this recording um, and then we took it to this guy who mastered it and we thought it wasn't ready before we were on the road so we were on the road and then we got it while we were on the road and we listened to it and we said this sounds like crap. We thought it was the mix. Turns out it was the mastering we found out years later. So we said, don't press anymore. 800 copies have been pressed. We had maybe three or 400. We sold them because we had them. We needed the money for gas, of course. <laughs> um, but when we got back, we wrote a bunch of new songs, which were really a lot of it inspired from the trip. I mean, you know, I was going to UCLA at the time. Um, I came up with the idea of Sync with California being, you know, again, trying to promote positive things. We just traveled around the country. I thought, you know, this is, this is sort of the idea that I had in mind and I was seeing it firsthand that we were able to go to all these different cities and I was just making phone calls, cold calls. I didn't know a lot of these people. Hey, we're in a band, we're in LA, we're gonna tour with this band Social Distortion. Social Distortion already had a little bit of a name because they'd put out a seven inch and 
Um, and we had social distortion on our compilation too. So when I came back, I thought, you know, that's really what the inspiration of writing Sick of California was. I was, I remember I was in class and I was writing some of the lyrics. I didn't know a lot of the languages. A friend of mine was French. She helped me with some of the French, you know. It's real simple shit, but I'm not from France. Je ne sais pas de France. You know, ich bin, von, ich bin nicht von Deutschland because I took German in class. And then, so I was writing the song, the lyrics for the song in class at UCLA. Um, and that's, that's why we ended up going, all right, we have better songs now. You know, when you come off the road, you're way tighter. Of course, yeah. um, we had written some of the new songs. We tried them out when we were on the road a little bit we, and then when we played shows when we got back because when you come off the road hey you're a tight machine play some shows they were really well we, we did some pretty amazing shows when we got back and that's when we realized okay we need to go back in the studio we had luckily met tom wilson um and he agreed to produce the record and that completely different uh, i mean it's almost an entirely different record because of most of the songs that were on the first one we didn't even use. Uh, I think we used a handful. You just stopped playing them. And yeah, and, and it's crazy because people will often say, oh, play those songs from the first record. I can't sing those songs. <laughs> There's so many words. There's no way. I don't even know how I did it then. And Sing With California is not about, oh, we're just going to, California is going to fall into the sea and we'll see you later. It was more no. about, you know. It's an irony, you know. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a joke. Although there is, I knew, oh, I'm, I was an environmentalist then. I knew about the, the concept of maybe they didn't call it global warming, but it, was, it didn't take a genius to see. We're destroying all our, our natural habitat and trying to you know, dig out resources from the ground with no concern about how we're destroying things. Um, so yeah, there, there was, people were talking then, oh, you know, eventually there's gonna be a big earthquake. California's gonna fall into the sea and now Arizona's gonna be the new Pacific coast. Yeah. <laughs> um. Also, another song I wanted to talk about was it's 1982, Men in Blue. And yeah. It's like so relevant to today. Yeah, um, that really came about because there were always shootings of little kids. And obviously in South Central, there was always fights between the police and gangs. And also we were experiencing it at shows. I mean, we would have shows and the cops would show up and take it out on us and we, we'd get in pit street battles with them. Um, so that was my sort of commentary on what are we going to do? You know, people now talking about defund the police, reform the police, abolish the police. You know, we've seen riots during COVID with, with you know, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We saw riots back in the 90s um, with uh, Rodney King. Yeah. You know, that's a whole nother thing to get into, but we, we have a police state in a certain, certain respects that we expect the police to fix all the problems in our society, um, and they can't. You know, we need to deal with the real serious problems of homelessness, that um, the crisis in our street, which is really a mental health and, and drug abuse um, problem, and the police are not should not be the ones to try and fix those problems. Of course, so, yeah, agreed. So, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe I, I didn't know about necessarily all of these problems, but definitely they, some of those things existed then. They still exist now. <laughs> I, I mean, I dug rap, and uh, I thought, hey, let's throw a little rap thing in here. And then one of the guys who hung out with us, who roadied for us in the Another State of Mind tour, Marlon, you know, I wrote some stuff, and I said, hey, Marlon, you want to write some stuff, and you want to sing the stuff that you wrote? So, yeah, I mean, it just sort of, like everything, it just sort of happened. It wasn't like, oh, we need to put a piece of rap, you know, part here because it's dealing with the police. It just sort of made sense. Yeah. How many other bands, punk rock bands in 1982 were rapping? I don't, I think that might be... The Beastie Boys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they might have been a little bit after that too, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Well, Cookie Puss. I don't know when Cookie Puss was, but Cookie Puss was yeah. hysterical. Yeah, I mean, these things just, they're not really well thought out. They just sort of happen. You know? Was there ever a, a, a rap project that you had? Uh, no, we were we talked about a Men in Blue Part Two, and that was an idea that never happened. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's always like you always hear about like around those times when 
You know, it was like, oh yeah, this guy had a rap project. You gotta hear it. It's hilarious. You know? <laughs> I mean, there was a club that I used to go to. One of the guys I went to UCLA with did a club um, called uh, Power Tools that was downtown. And near to that was another club that another guy I went to high school with, and I can't remember, but. I would go there and see rap bands and it was awesome. Yeah. So the uh, same thing, a, a lot of the rap in those days, in, at least in LA, was very DIY. Um, and you know, where we pressed our records, a lot of those bands were pressing their records. So you know, there was a sort of meeting of the minds in the sense that we respected what they were doing, they respected what we were doing. Um, I was telling you the story before about how I met these chefs, but mm -hmm. I've noticed, uh, and you're a chef, I've noticed a lot re recently, over the last few years, how many people that are working in kitchens, because I've had a few walk out when I've been going to a restaurant going, oh, we're fans. It's, it's amazing how many punk rockers are now working in, in not just, you know, when I when I was working, it was crappy Jacopo's Pizza, uh, Pizza Man, all that stuff. Yeah. But they're working in nice restaurants, and the food business, you know, the restaurant business is really a lot of punk rockers. The first time I ever even associated it was when I read Kitchen Confidential. Oh yeah, for sure. I think like it totally makes sense because of the hours you get to keep, and then. For me, it was always like I was kind of good at my work, so it was like, hey, I'm gonna go away for a couple of weeks. Can I have my job? Running? And they'd be like, well, you know. And so it was always like, so if you were good at it, you know, yeah. it was, you can make it work for you. And and the same thing going back to you being like, gotta make things work for me and do things to make it so I can do my life. And um, but yeah, I think like that, you know, finding like that it's just not showing up for work and you know checking in and knocking off some things or hitting some goals you know it's like actually like you're a part of something and like yeah. and for me when i realized like um you know hearing people go oh this is so amazing what, what's in this you know that is almost and actually sometimes it's even better to me like someone's like, oh i love that song or like like how, how did you like you know that, that record you guys put you know be put out it made me feel so good but like when it's real time and someone's like i just ate this makes me feel good and you see their smile it's just like oh you know so it's like it's really great feeling it's really satisfying yeah yeah right it's it's creative mm -hmm. just the same in the same way um and you get the satisfaction of making people happy hopefully and, <laughs> and inspiring them because for me i cook a lot well you see i yeah. built a pizza oven yeah. and food is really important it, it's crazy to me the two craziest things is when i meet someone who says yeah, I mean, I don't really listen to music. You know, sometimes the radio's on, but I, that just blows my mind. And then even more, because I, I think music is such an important thing for, for to make you, you know, to inspire you. It's, it's so primal. It goes back to when we were, you know, living in tribes, which is why people come together to live, uh, to live concerts, because there's a certain... I don't want to say religious, but that, that community sense you get at, when you go see a concert. And, and food is even more important. You, you, you have to eat. We all have to eat. And the fact that we're able to elevate the food that we get and, and, and do so, so many amazing things. And then I meet people like, eh, you know, food's not that important to me. What? Yeah. It's, it's just like, what? The things that you, I mean, you need it. You know, how, yeah. you, how could you live without? I mean, it's like you don't need, you don't, you don't ingest music, but how could you? get by without yeah. hearing melody and being affected yeah. by melody and how do you get by by like oh, I just eat whatever just like not even caring what like you're even when it, you think about the fuel that comes to your yeah. you know and I'm thinking I was thinking while you were saying about um like I was just kind of thinking about like how I source food and how I write menus and how and you know and just thinking how that goes back to like you know doing it all yourself absolutely and I think that like you know you know, BYO is a real, you know, for me at least, like, you know, here, like how that started and me living my life, like I cared about what I did and how, you know, what I was, what I was spending my money on and who I was spending my time with and, and it just feels good that way. And I think like, you know, it's really cool to think, you know, just thinking about how, as you were talking, I was just like, oh wow, like I don't even think about it. It's just a part of me, how I, you know, just how I grew up and how I just exist. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's this idea that you can do what you love and hopefully earn a living off of doing something you love instead of, 
you know, most people have to work at a job. They may love it, they may not, but they're working for someone else. When you get the opportunity to do something you love and hopefully inspire people to go out and make change in the world, that's a pretty awesome thing. <laughs>